Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see that you all survived the conference dinner last night. I apologize for the lack of uh, telephone reception. I don't know who was complaining on Twitter. And I also apologize for the lack of air conditioning, but the building was built before people thought about that sort of thing. So this morning, uh, we have an exceptional keynote from an exceptional lady. Again, very influential in my life. Uh, she was supposed to be here with us in person, but there are things happening in her life. Uh, the lady's name is Professor Jayati Murthy, and she is currently the Dean of Engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, she's a very senior person, and the reason why she's not here with us today is that she has been elected president of the Oregon State University. So she needs to move her life from one place to another. She sends her apologies and her regards. And as for her CFD credentials, you may have heard of this little code called Fluent. Okay, so that would be Jayati. So without further ado, uh, let's hear what Jati has to say for us. And I'm afraid there won't be any questions afterwards uh, because I don't feel uh, capable of answering the questions arising from a presentation like that. And Jati is actually asleep at the moment in California. Thank you for your attention. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jayati Murthy, and I'm Dean of Engineering here at UCLA. Uh, thank you for inviting me to do this talk at the 17th Open Forum Workshop. Uh, let me get uh, screen sharing started here, and we can get going. Here we go. And let me put this in presentation mode. So here we are. All right, so uh, the title of my talk is Multi-Scale Simulation Techniques for Subcontinuum Transport. Uh, I, want, I want to talk today about computational methods that we've been developing uh, to address, uh, first of all, small-scale heat transfer, uh, but also to talk a little bit about how this common set of methods can be developed to uh, describe subcontinuum transport of all kinds, uh, subcontinuum transport of gases, for example, uh, of electrons or other kinds uh, of transport where a single uh, unified particle viewpoint can be taken. All right, so why are we interested in this problem at all? Uh, in terms of heat transfer, uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of interest in looking at thermal transport uh, at very small scales, at submicron scales, particularly to do, for example, with microelectronics. So there are entire new generations of uh, microelectronics that people are working on. Uh, the first of these examples here that you see here, let me get my pointer started. Yeah, so the first of these that you see here is the nanotube bundle thin film transistor here. Uh, the channel region is made of uh, basically a material uh, uh, which consists of carbon nanotubes, for example, embedded in polymer. Uh, and that, uh, to understand transport there, uh, you know, there are severe heat transfer problems in these devices because you've got heat transfer, uh, you've got a medium uh, that is embedded in a low conducting polymer. Uh, and so understanding thermal transport on very small scales uh, is in fact very important. Uh, and so now uh, there are other kinds of, uh, uh, you know, new kinds of transistors as well, graphene field effect transistors. Now these are FinFETs, which have been around for a long time. Uh, and then of course there are thermoelectric materials. Uh, people are coming up with uh, nanocomposites uh, to develop thermoelectric materials where small scale heat transfer again is important. Uh, thermal interface materials uh, made out of carbon nanotubes, for example, have been around for some time now. And here too, understanding really small scale heat transfer uh, is very important. And so, uh, and so to understand heat transfer in these uh, domains, you have to be able to solve subcontinuum thermal transport uh, equations. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a minute. 
All right, so the broad title of the outline of my talk is, I'll tell you a bit about phonon transport. Uh, I know that many or perhaps most of you don't actually work in this field. Uh, and so I'll give you a broad overview of that. Uh, I'll also talk about something continuum transport in uh, gases, for example, rarefied gas dynamics, and show that a common particle viewpoint can be adapted for both. Uh, and the governing equations have algorithmic issues, which I'll talk about for a bit. Uh, we've taken a number of different approaches to solving these governing equations. And uh, I'll describe those, one of which has been quite successful, and that's the coupled ordinate method, COMET. And I'll tell you what that's all about, show you some results, and then, of course, conclusions. All right, so what are phonons? Right? Phonons are quanta of lattice vibrations. Right? And if you look at semiconductors and dielectrics, they are, in fact, the main carriers of energy. So energy is transported through lattice vibrations. Uh, and uh, the description of the lattice vibrations depends strongly uh, on the uh, structure of the underlying uh, crystal structure. Uh, so for example, silicon has a diamond structure and uh, this diamond structure leads to uh, vibrational characteristics, which are shown here uh, on this graph. Uh, and this is, a, this is called a dispersion curve or a dispersion relation. Uh, where uh, the frequency of vibration uh, is plotted against the wave vector, a uh, dimensionless wave vector in this case. Uh, and you see that there are a number of different branches here, longitudinal optical, transverse optical, longitudinal acoustic, transverse acoustic. These are just different modes of vibration of the crystal lattice. And each one of these has a omega versus a wave vector uh, description, right? Uh, and in a particle viewpoint, you might think about these as different classes of particles, LO particles, TO particles, LA particles, TA particles. Uh, the other thing that you should know about these is that the slope of this curve, the omega K curve, uh, is really, is, is called the group velocity, all right? This is the velocity with which uh, phononic particles travel. Uh, and of course, it depends on the frequency, and of course, it depends on uh, the branch of phonons. So if you look at uh, the slope of these particles, you see the slope of these curves, rather, you'll see that uh, LA and TA have uh, rather large slopes and therefore higher group velocities. And if you look at the optical phonons, LO and TO phonons, uh, their slopes are low uh, and their velocity of transport is low, right? So, so that's roughly what you need to know for now. Uh, and so let's carry on then. All right, so the other question that we really have to answer is when is it uh, a continuum? When is a medium a continuum? Well, that depends on lambda. The capital lambda that you see here is the mean free path of the particle, in this case, phonons. Uh, and L is the length scale of the medium. Now, the mean free path, as you know, is the length uh, on which particles interact with each other. And so if the mean free path is much smaller than the length scale of the medium, uh, then uh, the particles interact with each other far more frequently than they interact with uh, the boundaries. Uh, and therefore, in this limit, <coughs> what we have uh, is uh, essentially a continuum, all right? So these particles are unaware of the boundaries. They're only aware of each other. And in this limit, Fourier's law is actually valid. Now, if the opposite is true, if the mean free path of phonons is much larger or comparable to the length scale of the medium L, then particles interact with the boundaries far more often than they interact with each other. And the finiteness of the medium then becomes important. And in that limit, uh, Fourier's law is basically invalid, and you have to deal with the subcontinuum nature uh, of the problem. Right, so here we are. So that's the broad description. So we are really interested in regimes where uh, the mean free path of phonons is uh, either larger than or comparable to the length scale of the medium. Uh, and that's the regime that we'll be trying to describe. Now that regime is described by a distribution function of phonons, F, uh, 
Uh, and that is as usual a function of space x and time t, but also uh, another variable called the wave vector uh, k, all right? So that's an, a phase space. Now this is a distribution function, that's the number distribution function. Uh, corresponding to that is a phonon energy density, which is the number distribution function uh, multiplied by h bar omega. And so that gives you energy. Uh, now in equilibrium, uh, this E double prime, the phonon energy density uh, satisfies the Bose-Einstein distribution and the equilibrium energy density is then described by uh, this particular expression that you see here, right? Now, of course, uh, when, the, when heat transfer is happening, we are far away from equilibrium or you know, certainly disturbed from equilibrium. And so we do not have an E naught. E naught only occurs if you've got uh, equilibrium. All right, so, uh, so fine. So the story, therefore, the thing that I'd like you to remember here is that the distribution function is really a function, of course, of time, if you happen to have an unsteady problem. But if you have steady state, it's really a function of the physical space x and the phase space k, all right, the wave vector space k. And so physical space, of course, you all know, it's like every other CFD problem that you deal with. Uh, you have a physical space. In this particular case, it's showing a composite medium with particles distributed in a matrix. Uh, and of course, you'd have to discretize it in the usual way and so on. Uh, but corresponding to every point in space is a whole space uh, of K, of the wave vector K. And that is described by a Brillouin zone, uh, which has the shape that you see here that is tied to the crystal structure of uh, the material. Right now, now, no need to go into a whole lot of detail here. Just know that there are two spaces that we are trying to deal with, X, which is the physical space. It's a three-dimensional space, and K is the wave vector space, also a three-dimensional case, a space. Uh, and so uh, problems then are, unsteady problems have a dependence on seven different variables, three space, three K, and one of time. So it's a very big uh, space of variables that F depends on. And that makes the problem uh, very complicated and very expensive to solve. All right, so, so the question is, do you really need uh, to solve such a complicated problem? Uh, do we need, can we make some kind of approximation? It turns out there are classes of physical problems where solving this complexity is in fact important. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about where this, this kind of resolution is needed. Uh, now, if you look at typical electronics, for example, this is a FinFET. Uh, the way heat transfer happens, so you see the transistor here, all right? So that's your uh, transistor. Now, in a FinFET, or in fact, a, any kind of microelectronic uh, device, here, what happens is that uh, you deposit energy in the electrons, right? Because when, when you apply a voltage, and electron phonon interactions essentially are the way that the energy that you give the electrons uh, gets dumped into the phonon field. And phonons are the major way that heat transfer happens. It's the phonons that take energy and take it to the boundaries and dissipate energy there, right? So, so the question is uh, which electrons interact with which phonons, right? Now, it turns out that electron phonon interactions uh, are not uniform, right? Uh, there are particular phonon groups uh, which interact with electrons, other phonon groups don't interact with electrons. And so electron phonon interactions deposit energy selectively to particular phonon groups. And those phonon groups then interact with other phonon groups. And uh, some groups move faster than the others. And the scattering rates between in these groups is different. And so there's a great deal of granularity that depends on the wave vector associated with that phonon group. So resolving the wave vector space uh, is very, very important in microelectronics. Uh, the other place where this uh, resolving case space becomes really important is when you have multi-material interfaces. So for example, here, uh, we've got silicon on one side, we've got germanium on the other side, and here is an interface. Uh, now, the dispersion curves of silicon and germanium uh, have very different frequency distributions, right? And so states which uh, occur in silicon, these high-frequency states, 
do not occur in germanium and therefore uh, phonons associated with these states are unable to cross over into germanium. So there is an interface resistance that is observed uh, for some phonons, but not for other phonons, which have states on both sides. So uh, energy transport is very selective and it depends on the K uh, vector of the particular phonons that we're talking about, right? So, uh, so resolving K space then becomes very important. Uh, it's certainly important in entire classes of composites where you ha have you know, materials of different kinds and transport across the interfaces then uh, is determined. The resistance, uh, interfacial resistance is then dependent on uh, how the K-space uh, works out. And so K-space needs to be resolved. All right, so, so how do you describe uh, transport in these, uh, in these kinds of materials? Uh, the, this is described by the phonon Boltzmann transport equation or the BTE as we call it. And the BTE is shown here. It looks a little complicated. Let me just take a minute to explain what this is. Uh, what you have is a steady, uh, well, I mean, this, this is a steady state equation even though you see T there del dot of V times E double prime. Okay, this is a spatial gradient, del dot of V times E double prime, uh, equal to a scattering term on the right-hand side. Okay, remember that E double prime is the energy associated with phonons, F is the distribution function, multiplied by H bar omega, the unknown variable is the phonon energy that we're solving for, right? So, so what is this equation here? V is the phonon group velocity, and this is del dot of V times uh, the energy, all right? Looks very much like a convection term, right? If all, all of you who do fluid mechanics understand this to be a convection term. Uh, and on the right hand is scattering. Now, if scattering didn't exist, uh, this is pretty simple, right? If somebody told you what the group velocity is, which we know from the dispersion curve, the slope of the dispersion curve, uh, this is just a straight old convection operator. And all it does is move E double prime in the direction of the group velocity, which is known a priori, right? So this is just moving the energy in the direction of the group velocity. Now, what does, so the real difficulty in phonon transport is really the scattering term. And what the scattering term does is it moves energy between phonons with different K vectors, right? So it redistributes energy by scattering between phonons are different K vectors. So, so basically what we're saying is that energy would have moved in straight lines along the group velocity direction, but for the fact uh, that there is scattering and the scattering takes energy from one kind of phonon group and transports it to another kind of phonon group. Right? So, but the scattering is extremely complex. It's very, very expensive to compute. Uh, there are many different kinds of phonon interactions, phonon scattering mechanisms, uh, but the ones that are most important to us are three phonon interactions, where three kinds of phonons interact with each other. Uh, and, uh, but these also are very complex to compute. They must satisfy momentum and energy conservation rules. Uh, scattering matrix elements are very, very complex to compute and there are literally millions and millions of interactions. So this is a very, very expensive term uh, to compute. So, uh, so here we go. So what do we do? Now, one of the most common approximations uh, that is made is the relaxation time approximation, where the scattering term is approximated as the equilibrium energy minus the energy that you're actually computing here divided by a relaxation time, which in this case, uh, we're labeling as T effective. So the T effective hides many cells, uh, it uh, represents many different kinds of interactions all grouped together with an effective time scale over which those interactions are happening. This is called the relaxation time, right? Now, uh, I won't trouble you with all of this complexity here. Uh, so really just look at this equation. We've got a convection-like term. We've got a known velocity field associated with each type of phonon associated with a K vector. And on the right-hand side, we've got uh, a scattering term. The scattering term essentially takes energy from yeah, belonging to a particular K vector and dumps it into a reservoir E naught. Uh, and from that is how the redistribution of energy actually happens. 
Now, associated with this relaxation time is a Knudsen number. The Knudsen number is really nothing but a, res, uh, a, uh, a, a mean free path of phonons divided by a length. The mean free path of phonons is nothing but the group velocity times the effective relaxation time. And length is a typical length scale uh, of the problem. And so the Knudsen number essentially tells you whether you are in a uh, Fourier regime, which is a continuum, continuum regime, or you are in a subcontinuum regime. Right? So if the mean free path is very small compared to the length, that is, you are in a very small Knudsen number regime, Fourier conduction, it can be shown that the Boltzmann transport equation essentially, uh, you can derive, uh, you're in the Fourier regime and it gives you the Fourier conduction equation in effect. Uh, but on the other hand, if the Knudsen number is very large, that is the mean free path is comparable to a larger than the length scale of the problem. Uh, and that, that in that regime, uh, you're really in a subcontinuum regime. All right, so let's look at this a little bit further. Uh, now, uh, I said before that in fact, the equations that we're seeing for phonons actually are very, very similar to those uh, that describe rarefied gas dynamics, particularly an ESBGK model and ellipsoidal statistical but now gross crook model. And if you look at uh, the structure of the equations that describes that model, again, a distribution function uh, plus a del dot of CF equal to a relaxation-like term, uh, again, very, very similar structure. If you have steady state, this guy goes away. This is really a convection kind of term. Uh, the velocity of uh, gas molecules is known a priori, and this is a relaxation time type of term. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff on this uh, slide. I won't go through them. But I, what I would like you to know is that the structure of the equation describing the distribution function for rarefied gas dynamics is very, very similar to that uh, for phonons. And so if you create computational methods for one, you can actually use them uh, for the other as well. All right, so now let, let's go back to phonons and take a look at the dimensionless uh, equations, the Boltzmann transport equation. And here, if you non-dimensionalize everything, you get a del dot of E double prime equal to a scattering term. And instead of a relaxation time, because of non-dimensionalization, you now have a Knudsen number. And you recall that the Knudsen number is different for each group of phonons denoted by uh, the wave vector k. And the Knudsen number is the mean free path divided by the length scale of uh, the problem, right? So, so lambda is the mean free path. All right, very nice. So the thing that you should take away from this is when the Knudsen number is very small, then scattering entirely dominates and the convection side of this equation does not matter at all, right? So it's just phonons scattering on each other and that's the continuum regime. Now, when the Knudsen number is very large, if it's infinitely large, there is no scattering at all. And each phonon group is just described by its convection equation. And in fact, energy is just transported in the direction of the wave uh, of the group velocity. Right. So, so what's so hard about that? I mean, we know small Newton number, we know how to solve Fourier equations, we know how to solve uh, you know, pure convection equations. So those are easy, the limits are easy. The trouble though is for any realistic material, there's a huge range of mean free paths, which is really saying that there's a huge range of Newton numbers. Okay, so some groups of phonons are very diffusive, some are purely ballistic and travel like cannonballs. Others have mixed behavior. And if you look at the mean free path of phonons uh, for, diff for silicon, for example, for all the different kinds of phonons that exist for silicon, uh, you'll see that uh, some kinds of phonons have uh, you know, mean free paths that are you know, maybe three orders of magnitude different. Other kinds of phonons have other ranges. But in fact, the overall range of mean free paths goes from something like one in four, one in five, uh, to you know, roughly of the order of one, all right? So the huge range of mean free paths and therefore a huge range of Newton numbers. And uh, there are all kinds of couplings between all of these different phonon groups. Uh, but the thing that you should take away is Newton number high means uh, the scattering term doesn't matter. 
convection term is the only thing that matters and therefore spatial coupling is dominant. It's just transport in space. When Knudsen number is low, uh, the convection term doesn't matter so much. It's really scattering between phonons. That's the big thing. And so phase space coupling, that is coupling in K space is really dominant. And for mixed Knudsen numbers, both are important. And in fact, all of these regimes actually occur in, uh, in these computations, right? So, uh, all right, so that's the story. Now, oh, in fact, let me go back and, uh, and point out something else. So what is the nature of these equations? How many equations do we have? Now, what we have is as many governing partial differential equations as there is a discretization in K space. So how, how do we solve these problems, right? We discretize physical space, we discretize K space, uh, and of course, if you have an unsteady problem, you'll be time stepping. But let's say that you don't. So when you discretize, so of course, you've got a physical mesh, which describes the X space, and you've got a phase space mesh that discretize the K space, right? All right, so how, so how do you do this? For every point in K space, you have a PDE that describes, you have a single PDE, which is this guy. And so you have as many partial differential equations as there are discrete K points that you're willing, uh, that, that you've got, all right? So you've got a huge range, or you've got a huge number of uh, partial differential equations, as many partial differential equations as there are discretizations of the K space. And these are all coupled to each other through the scattering term. That's really the computational problem uh, that you're trying to solve. Now, of course, you can solve it in a simplistic way. And one way to do it is to use a sequential solution procedure. So what do you do? You go off and you initialize your problem. You pick one point in K space, solve all physical space for that one K point. Uh, you, solve the you pick a second point in K space, solve for all physical space and so on. Uh, and then uh, you compute something called the lattice temperature, which is your way of coupling all of these K points check for convergence, not converge, go round and round and round. And so essentially what you're saying is that you pick a K point, you solve in space, go to the next K point, solve in space, do all of the K points, couple them up uh, you know, through something called a lattice temperature, and then you keep going round and round till you get convergence, right? So that's certainly one way of doing it. And people have been doing it that way. Uh, in fact, let me go here, but this turns out to be very, very slow, all right? Because what, what the problem with the procedure like this is that uh, the K points are very loosely coupled. You know, they're only sequentially solved and so they're very loosely coupled. And so if you have uh, a problem in which scattering is dominant, uh, this is going to be very, very, very slow to converge, all right? So typically you can't use this kind of a procedure for any realistic kind of submicron problem. Right, so uh, people have been doing different things. Now, one uh, area that we played with it is actually not to solve that set of equations at all, but to make approximations to those equations, right? So we developed something called a hybrid Fourier BTE solver uh, idea. And so here, what we do is that we try to separate phonons which have ballistic behavior where the full Boltzmann transport equation has to be solved uh, from the ones that uh, are really diffusive, you know, so they have very low Knudsen numbers, they are quite easily described by a Fourier type of equation, so we try to pull those out. Uh, and so uh, what we do is we define a Knudsen number cutoff, and so for phonon bands that are, uh, you know, low in, so we separate our phonons into low Knudsen number phonons and high Knudsen number phonons using this cutoff that we've defined. Now, if you're, <coughs> sorry, when your Knudsen number is very small, uh, we just solve a Fourier-like equation for those. And if the Knudsen number is high, then we solve the actual Boltzmann transport equation. And these are coupled together through something called the lattice temperature. You don't have to really know a whole lot about that. But the point, the bigger point, is that uh, we try to separate high Knudsen number from low Knudsen number phonon bands. And uh, this is an approximation, of course, because you know things are usually mixed. You can't, you know, you can't separate them, and how you separate them depends on how you know how you choose these cutoffs. But if you do that, uh, here's what you do, right? So you initialize your lattice temperature, 
you solve your Fourier bands, then you solve your BTE bands, uh, you resolve the coupling between them, which lies, which comes through this lattice temperature, check for convergence, and then go round and round and solve these. Now, the separation turns out to be a really good thing, you know, separating low and high nits and numbers, and you can get a very, very strong uh, convergence. All right, so this is uh, a plot of acceleration in CPU time. Uh, and uh, here what we're comparing is a ratio of the time taken if you solve everything using a Boltzmann transport equation uh, divided by uh, the time you would take using this kind of a hybrid approach for a variety of different parameters in the problem. Uh, you don't really need to know the detail. The bigger point that I'm trying to make here is across a variety of governing parameters in the problem, you can get very strong acceleration using this kind of a hybrid uh, separation, right? So the time taken using an all BTE method is generally much higher uh, than that uh, taking a hybrid approach, separating the high and low mix and number problems, right? Across the board, you get very, very good performance. Next, this is what, certainly one useful way of doing business. Now, uh, the, of course, this is an approximate method, right? Because you are replacing for some phonons, uh, the Boltzmann transport equation with a Fourier type equation. And which ones you're replacing depends on an arbitrary cutoff moots and number that you've chosen. And so the question is, what is the price you pay uh, you know, if you do this kind of thing? So here we're considering heat conduction in a square domain. Uh, two boundaries are at T1, two boundaries are at T2. It's a two-dimensional problem. Uh, and uh, we you know, compute heat transfer in this using this kind of a hybrid approach. And what we're going to do is to look at uh, the heat flux in this case, right? Uh, you know, for each kind of phonon uh, branch that we have, each kind of phonon that we have, and uh, we're comparing the heat transfer rate uh, using an all BTE approach, if you actually did the full problem, versus this kind of a hybrid approximation. And we're looking at all the different kinds of phonons, TA, LA, LO, TO, and so on. Uh, and so the dotted lines are the approximation, the solid lines are the real thing. And you see that, in fact, the approximation works really well in a very detailed sort of way, all right, right across uh, you know, the length scale, the local heat transfer rate actually works uh, very, very well indeed. So you're not paying a huge price for making the kind of approximation that we did. All right, so now let me talk about a different uh, method uh, called Comet. And here I want to take you back to the sequential solution procedure, right? You remember what we said there, the sequential solution procedure acknowledges that there are two kinds of spaces, there's a physical space and a computation and a uh, wave vector space, a K space. And you pick a K point, solve in physical space, pick a second K point, solve in physical space, uh, do the coupling between all the K points and then go round and round in circles till you get convergence. That's your sequential method. Uh, now, we don't do it that way. Uh, so we came up with the couple ordinates method. And here what you do is you pick a K point and you solve, uh, I mean, you solve, you pick a physical point and you solve all the K points together, go to a second physical point, solve all the K points together, uh, couple them up through a lattice temperature, and then you go round and round, right? So we're sort of flipping this on its head. Uh, and of course, the question you can ask is, uh, why is this any better, right? So, uh, so if you couple all the K points together, you do the scattering problem well, but you don't do the transport or the convection problem well if you solve them cell by cell sequentially. Uh, so why should this be any better? So it wouldn't be any better, except for the fact uh, that we embed this point coupled procedure uh, in a, uh, it's a, embedded as a relaxation sweep in a geometric multigrid scheme. Uh, and the structure of the, uh, the matrix inversion at any given physical point is such that uh, we can actually get order end performance. So it turns out to be you know, very, very efficient. Right? So, and the thing that gives us order end performance uh, is that at any given physical point, uh, the structure of the problem has nice geometric structure. It has an arrowhead structure, and that makes for very, very efficient inversions of the, uh, uh, of the scattering matrix at every given uh, point.
And these can be solved in order n operations where n is the number of equations at any given point. All right, so, uh, so this is our geometric multigrid scheme. And some of you, of course, have used this in computational fluid mechanics where uh, the physical space, uh, this is your actual computational grid that you're using to solve your problem. Agglomerations of this grid are used to create uh, different levels. And cycling between these levels is used to actually communicate information, physical information from the boundaries to the interior. And this is absolutely critical in getting convergence for these point coupled uh, kinds of approaches. Okay, so uh, what kind of performance do we get? So here's the problem we're trying to solve again. Square domain, uh, T1, T1, T2, T2, heat conduction problem. Uh, and uh, this is a 50 by 50 grid, though of course we use other kinds of grids as well. Uh, here's the uh, dispersion curve for silicon that's being used. Uh, this is uh, the Brillouin zone or the, uh, the K-space uh, discretization that you see there. Uh, and then here are various scattering parameters and a, an effective Knudsen number that's been defined now, using all of these different scattering mechanisms, right? Not, not really important. The main thing that I want to get across to you is acceleration using the Comet method. This is acceleration in computational time, CPU time. And so this is comparing the time taken by a sequential procedure versus the new Comet procedure. Uh, uh, and uh, what you have here is the Knudsen number. These different bars are different discretizations of the K space, all right? So now not deeply important, but that, there we are. Now, the thing that I want you to notice is, that, you know, the minute the Knudsen number becomes smaller, not Knudsen number from one or lower, lower is in this direction here, we get very substantial accelerations over uh, the sequential procedure, particularly as you get to lower and lower Knudsen numbers. Now, so that's that's telling you that right across a range, pretty good range of Knudsen numbers, you can get very strong acceleration using the Comet technique. Now, when your Knudsen number is large, uh, we see that in fact, Comet does worse than the sequential procedure. Uh, that's not terribly important though, because a large Knudsen number basically means this is just a pure convective problem. It's not very expensive to solve anyway. You can see that the computation, computational times are actually way, way lower than uh, others. And so this is not a very important regime. So yeah, we don't do very well in this regime, but everywhere that it matters, in fact, we get very strong uh, computational performance. Right Now here are some actual numbers. This is Knudsen number at the top, right? And then uh, comparing at each Knudsen number, comet versus sequential. Uh, and you see that in the high Knudsen number regime, which is where scattering is not very important, uh, certainly uh, sequential does better than Comet. That's really this area. Uh, but on the other hand, the actual time for computation is extremely small. Now, as the Knudsen number becomes smaller and smaller, the computational time uh, really becomes bigger and bigger. And in fact, at low Knudsen numbers, you'll see that Comet really significantly outperforms uh, the sequential procedure. Uh, down below are iteration counts. That doesn't mean a whole lot, but for what it's worth, uh, sequential iteration counts are very high and comet iteration counts turn out to be much lower. But the main thing that you really should be looking at is computational time and there very significant accelerations are possible uh, for uh, you know, if you're looking at um, Knudsen numbers that are you know, one or below, right? All right, so, so there we are. Now, uh, I wanna show you one application of this kind of idea for gas phase transport, rarefied gas dynamics. And here is an interesting problem. Uh, this is a problem involving what, what is called squeezed film damping. This is for very, very small uh, MEM switches. And you see one of these here. So what is the switch? You've got a uh, metal membrane, in this case, made out of nickel, right? Hanging over an electrode, which is shown in brown here, and so uh, what happens is that you apply a voltage between the metal and the electrode. And by applying this voltage, you cause this metal membrane, which is gold or yellow here, uh, to bend down and touch the electrode and therefore closing the switch, right? Now, a 2D representation of this, a simplified representation is shown here, where this is the wall is essentially this guy here. It's the metal, right? 
and uh, the electrode is sitting here at the bottom. Uh, and by applying a voltage between these two, you would be causing this wall to move. Now we do a simplified problem. Yeah, the wall is either moving up or down. It's a steady state problem. But the main thing is that the length scales involved here are so small that the gas that sits here is essentially in a rarefied gas regime. So we're trying to compute uh, the velocity field uh, or the velocity distribution uh, uh, here, the distribution of uh, the velocities of gas molecules in this rarefied uh, gas dynamic situation. Uh, I showed you before that for, uh, for the ESBGK model, uh, the equations are very, very similar to the phonon transport model. And so we can use very similar kinds of techniques. And so here are results showing uh, performance, computational performance for different values of the beam velocity. The beam is either going up or down in this case. Uh, and we're doing either a sequential procedure or a comet-like procedure. And so this is showing you the iteration count for different values of the beam velocity. Uh, and here are some physical parameters that you compute, forces, which are very similar. Of course, the answer doesn't change. All we're talking about is acceleration techniques. And here is computational time for both of these. And here is the speed up level uh, in this kind of problem. So even in this kind of problem, we see uh, quite significant speed up uh, using a comet-like procedure as opposed to a sequential procedure. Right. So yeah. And now it turns out that these point couple procedures such as Comet are actually very good uh, on parallel computers. And so here we are uh, showing a relatively small problem. Uh, this is basically either a 50 by 50 mesh or a 100 by 100 uh, mesh, uh, physical mesh. And this is speed up versus the number of processors. Um, now, of course, perfect scaling is the black line out there. That's ideal. And here we're showing how this performs as the number of, uh, this is a relatively small problem. Uh, you see, uh, you know, there's a sequential procedure which kind of tails off once you get to a larger number of uh, processes, uh, either for a 50 by 50 mesh or a 100 by 100 mesh. Whereas uh, the point couple procedure actually does relatively well, even for this kind of a small spatial uh, problem. Now, of course, we do much, much better if you have a much bigger spatial uh, grid. Uh, and uh, so if you look at speed up versus the, uh, the number of processors, uh, you see that even though the number of processors is getting now quite large, uh, we actually deliver virtually ident uh, ideal uh, performance, right? So point couple procedures generally do very, very well on uh, parallel processing or uh, distributed computing kinds of uh, architectures. All right. So now what you saw was a bunch of toy problems, uh, but we've been using this kind of procedure to do much more complicated problems. This is a, a chunk of a composite where you've got uh, silicon uh, and germanium uh, you know, particles. You know, I believe this is silicon particles in germanium. Uh, and uh, so you've got a physical mesh that's quite complicated. You've got a pretty complex uh, dispersion relationship in both. Uh, and interfacial transport as well. And we are making uh, predictions of thermal conductivity uh, versus temperature for all kinds of different uh, setups here. One of them is nanoporous silicon. So we've got pores here in silicon in the background. Uh, that's a thermal conductivity computation. Uh, we've got a composite calculation. We've got planar interfaces that we're looking at, uh, but fairly complex uh, computations being done uh, with uh, you know either pure silicon, pure germanium, etc., uh, and uh, I you know without going into the details, the physical details in this uh, prediction here, uh, let me simply say that this kind of calculation would simply be impossible if you didn't have computational techniques of this kind. You just could not do this sequentially at all. Right. Uh, all right. So so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, what I talked about here is that uh, we can use a single particle framework for a variety of transport problems. Uh, those involving phonons, those involving electrons, those involving rarefied gas dynamics. And uh, we've developed a set of approaches, either using hybrid, which are approximate approaches, or an approach like Comet, to couple both the physical and phase spaces efficiently.
And both of these deliver quite significant gains in uh, computational speed. And uh, what's interesting about uh, algorithms such as Comet is they are very heavy computationally at every physical point in space. And because of this, we get very good scaling on uh, domain decomposition type of uh, paradigms on, on parallel platforms. Right. So let me close there. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the talk uh, and thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Jayati. Any questions? It's a joke because whatever you ask me, I'll say, I don't know, ask Gavin. So thank you for your uh, patience. I would also like thank you to thank Jayati for doing this for us. I was really hoping she would be here with us in time. And uh, with that, time for coffee and our regular session start at 10. Thank you. Immediately after the session, immediately after the session are the splash talks here. So please be here and for those online, join us as well.